and nature. Uh, so it was, it was a truly outstanding, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, sh just sh shunning any uh, uh, shred of Eurocentrism, uh, 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 critiquing methodological nationalism and, and giving us a, a very wonderful perspective on what the current condition is and how we can find some ways out of it. So it was very good. Uh, uh, that book was uh, truly uh, enlightening. Uh, um, he also works on religion and on Chinese religion. He's influenced a lot of people in that in the field, and he works also on now, or perhaps for some time now, on Chinese, Japanese, and other East Asian secularisms. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So, so without any further ado, I think it was two minutes yeah. and a half. Uh, but uh, now, please. Uh, <laughs> He's also known as Baiti to many of us. Many of us, so Baiti, Mr. Laura, please come. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, the very kind uh, introduction, and uh, uh, Rajiv. And uh, I, I tried to, you know, keep the introduction short because my paper is quite long and. Uh, I, I hope to be able to get through it because I have not been very well, but I'm post viral at this point, so don't worry. <laughs> get anything from me, but exhaustion sits in. And um, I also want to thank, take this opportunity to thank CSDS, the director, the chairman, and, um, and Rajiv and others who have invited me to spend uh, six months here. I have already completed more than four months. And, um, uh, we've had some very interesting conversations, as uh, Ravi Kant has pointed out. And uh, it has been, after uh, 45 years of living away from India, a very interesting moment to come back, uh, to get the cultural and intellectual vibrancy of the place uh, again. So I'm very happy, <coughs> and let's hope my happiness stays. Uh, <laughs> And um, it's also wonderful to see so many friends uh, here. It's almost like we're having a small uh, dinner time discussion, but I'll try to make it a little more formal. Okay. Uh, oh, why is it not moving? Yes, I can think. Yes, I said, what are my goals? <laughs> my goals are, um, as a historian, uh, and not everybody considers me a historian, but uh, I do think of myself as a historian primarily. I want to tell the, uh, the story of secularism in Asia. Um, I should also warn some of you who have read my book that a lot of the materials are from this last book, and, uh, but there's also some new thinking on it. <coughs> story of secularism in Asia, not from the perspective of modernization or westernization, but from what I call circulatory histories, right? And uh, what do I mean by circulatory histories? Uh, I mean that these are histories that are not tunnel vision, that do not belong to a subject of the nation or civilization or whatever community, uh, but uh, things, uh, historical processes that go from one place to another, they don't necessarily come back, but they can come back often in different ways. And so how, so to, to sort of put it more concretely, how what I call uh, the sort of, the European process of secularization, which is a parochial European phenomenon, uh, which had, we had thought of as a universal thing, how we should think of it much more as a package uh, which then impacts different societies, circulates among different societies, uh, gets transformed in them, and also trans uh, gets and uh, transforms them, but also gets transformed and circulates out to other societies and back and forth. Yeah? So the goal of uh, circulatory history is in fact to avoid any sort of uh, necessary subjects of history, whether they're national or not. So, what I want to do first is to uh, talk about China. Well, first I will talk a little bit about the package of European secularism. And then uh, the second part, in a way, uh, would be, I didn't consider the first part to be the first part, but it is. Second part is China. And the third part is to look at uh, how also uh, we can compare what is uh, happening in China and in Europe with processes in 
Japan, and uh, and uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about India. Just my last two or three slides, uh, because I, I I know I'm going to be I'm sitting among uh, authorities on Indian secularism, and I don't dare say too much about it. So uh, uh, I will invite you to take my comparative lessons and help me think through how it could or could not uh, apply. <laughs> it's looking like a <laughs> so uh, that's that's uh, what my goal is here. So I thought I should speak about India since you know I am uh, speaking in India. So okay, <clears throat> and the the, the uh, method that I have developed to talk about how circulatory histories uh, can be used for comparison as well is what I call convergent comparison, and I gave a talk on this uh, a few months ago here in this very room. And converging comparison refers to the idea that there is something which is circulating, let it say in this case it's the secular package, and um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's a package that circulates, and how does it, and the zone, uh, and the impact that it has upon a, a society is the zone of uh, 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 convergence and you have and it sort of affects uh, different societies and how then the comparison comes when really with how these societies deal with this particular impact, how their own institutional problems and processes handle it. And so it becomes possible to talk about something that circulates but also compare it. <clears throat> so uh, first you talk about the formation of the secular in Europe. And uh, we all know also a great friend of uh, CSDS, uh, Professor Charles Taylor, probably a preeminent philosopher, um, uh, has a very persuasive account of the history of Western secularization in his book known as The Secular Age. And from the perspective of circulatory history, this is, uh, I would say that the secular age is a local history, it's a parochial history of, uh, of Europe, of the North Atlantic, both sides of the, especially one side of the North Atlantic, that becomes hegemonic with the rise of uh, Western global domination, right? So I want to see how the package described by Taylor impacts, transforms, and is transformed in different parts of Asia, uh, so that the religion secular relationship is more complexly understood in this global context. Okay, it did move. Now the Taylor narrative in CSDS is very well known, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, besides it's a mammoth book, so you know. But just to sort of perhaps radically simplify, the first thing I want to say is that he's really talking about a Christian framework. And it remains within that Christian framework. And what he says basically is that there's a transition from uh, a porous self to a buffered self in uh, from late medieval Europe, what happens is that the self is considered something that is penetrated by supernatural forces, by ideas of God, by cosmological things. And then gradually over the um, uh, Renaissance Reformation and so on, you get the idea of a buffered self, which is closed, which sort of sees itself as self-sufficient, as at least not uh, shaped by supernatural elements. and. Of course, ideas of, um, and in, for a long time, the idea of this was also facilitated by the idea of God as not mediated by the church, but as a personal God in the Protestant traditions and so on. Uh, but ultimately, it leads to uh, the Buffett cell loses the need in these parts of Northwestern Europe uh, for God himself, right? So I call this the transcendence of transcendence, you know, in a way that uh, Taylor is describing. Now, uh, I want to say, so it has to do with also the process that we call the disenchantment process, that Max Weber called disenchantment of the world. <coughs> now, Taylor's concept uh, refers uh, principally to the concept of, his concept of religion is more or less equated with ideas of faith and belief. Right? This is absolutely central for him. The idea of faith in God, in the notion of the Western God, and so on. Now, I would say that this concept is very much an Abrahamic and even more pronouncedly a Protestant one, 
that cannot be sustained from many other uh, parts of the world. In many um, uh, religions, what you have ritual cultivation practices, whether it's tantric or Confucian, you have ideas of reciprocities, you have vows, you have divination, sacrifice, and a whole host of modes of human, uh, superhuman uh, interaction that uh, play an equally more, an equally important role, if not more important than the idea of faith or belief. I always give the example of Singapore, where of course you have multiple religions, you have mosques, you have temples, you have Chinese temples, you have varieties of Indian and Chinese temples. And when students go before an exam, they visit each one of these, right? I mean, so it tells you that belief can be just one element uh, among, uh, you know, you cover all bases, you know, and so on. So I'm sure that happens in India too. Uh, hopefully it still happens. <laughs> Um, so I would say that, uh, now one other thing Taylor does is that he also details, it's a very comprehensive and also historically very dense account of how this transition as it were from the forest to the buff itself, it also accompanies the ideas changing relationship between religious faith, belief and politics, you know, politics of such as nationalism or ethnicity or the idea of a providential political mission like the Americans had with Manifest Destiny where they were in fact destined to cover the uh, continent and we go beyond um, and so on. So all of these things he sort of, uh, but in the contemporary secular age he finds faith and belief in the West to have become a voluntary phenomenon, right? Unmoored from its institutional underpinning. So today you can be a, a, a Christian, tomorrow you can be a Taoist, uh, or you can, <coughs> you know, uh, be a Mayan, believer in Mayan religion or something like that. This is essentially what has happened. It's become new age religiosity for many people. In, uh, uh, there's some chairs in public front too. So, so he, he does, he has a very comprehensive view of how this happens. Now, <clears throat> what for Taylor is a phase of secularization, especially its association with nationalism and so on, I deem to be very crucial to secularization. And I call this the confessionalization of religion. By the way, I forgot to mention, you know, I have a very dense slides. But what I have done, spent uh, a couple of days doing, is just uh, uh, bold, you know, putting in bold, not in bold, putting in bold and italics the parts that you might want to read because it becomes very difficult otherwise. Uh, so what I uh, what I deem to be really crucial to what is incidental in Taylor's analysis is the confessionalization of religion. Now what does that mean? It has to do with the religious wars of the 16th, 17th century in Europe and it is one where the identity of the religious believer becomes, ident uh, becomes uh, identified with the community. Right? So this is the idea of a chosen people, whether you're a Protestant or a Reformed Catholic or whatever, you're a chosen people or a community is integrated with the church and the state. So in a way, it becomes like a proto-national form. Right? There's an identity of belief, of uh, political control, and there is very much a conversionary imperative. Because we are the chosen, we are the same, you are there. Right? Which has very much the, the sort of dual structure of nationalism. Right? And I have tried to make this argument uh, in the book and elsewhere that this is uh, something uh, which uh, takes place, and I'll talk about it a little more, uh, during this, uh, you know, from the period from about 1200 to 1800, uh, gradually. And the principle, of course, is the Latin phrase that is often used after the Westphalian, quis regio ius religio, whose realm his religion. Right? So the kings uh, and the, the royalty, or the ruler of a certain area, also got to choose what the religion of that area is. And, um, and we know that this kind of warfare went on. It is only in the 20th century uh, 
that the Western nation state, and really in France, which is considered the heart of secularism and so on, is not until after 1907 that the state stopped fostering some form of national religion. Right? There was always a national religion. So that was a legacy. And uh, then the idea of secularism as we know it now really emerges and develops. Now, uh, this is actually something that uh, Rajiv has also written about, not particularly in this form, but uh, the deeper idea of what he calls deep diversity, uh, is that uh, is our Western nation states capable of deep diversity or does it have to take place within the framework of a Christian understanding, right? And is that the reason why you have so many problems with different religions uh, in the West uh, now, okay? Right? So, uh, of course, he, he will also urge that India has the basis of deep diversity, uh, also in its constitutional structure, perhaps, and talk about that. <clears throat> so, the specificity of the religious community forms, chosen people, state church, integration, conversionary imperative, these are the kinds of things that make a difference, that's part of the package of this uh, secular religious divide and what happens to secularism. So it is really, in a way, I'm talking uh, about both ideas of uh, sociological ideas, but also uh, social organization of religion, which begins to uh, be the the, uh, the power or the engine that pushes uh, through uh, during uh, the, the early modern period in Europe. And this is very different, this social organization is very different from places like South Asia and East Asia and so on, where the whole relationship between religion and politics is organized completely, to the extent that we can call anything religious that uh, are very different. <coughs> now the other thing is that the circulation of this package uh, takes place within kind of the asymmetry of power and temporalities in global history, right? Uh, there is what happens, and this is an important idea that I think uh, I want to convey, is that there is a telescoping. Uh, there is a kind of a telescoping that happens between the whole confessionalization and secularism, which happened in different phases in Europe, uh, gets telescoped by the time it impacts the rest of the world, particularly in the 19th century. Right? Secularist ideas come simultaneously with religious, what in India we call communalism or confessionalization, uh, what I call confessional nationalism as a second phase. <clears throat> so in Asia, this is simultaneous or telescope, partly because of imperialist penetration, of missionizing, and the lack of cultural recognition of the colonized. But Asian nationalists also very much seek to imitate this model that seems to have made the West so powerful. Right. That and this is a very important part of this thing. I hope these are not my clothes, so I don't know how to turn off some of these sounds. A mirror to me. Hopefully there's no more. If it does happen, I'll give it to one of you. Uh, maybe I can just turn it off. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so the nationalists also uh, <coughs> seek to imitate the models of the strong nation through this uh, process of confessionalization. Okay, now let's go to China. Religion and state power in China. In order to understand uh, what secularism is in Asian society, we need to understand what comes to be called religion in these societies. Because as Talal Asad and so many others have told us, um, it's not at all clear. I mean, you know, you have this Western model of a church and so on that uh, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, fit many of these societies. So I want to read you this long quotation from the 4th century BCE in China, a minister explicating uh, the cosmology to the king of Chu, who was one of the warring states of that time. Anciently, he says, men and spirits did not mingle. There were special men and women called Xi and Wu, who are really shamans, who supervised the position of the spirits at the ceremony, sacrificed to them, and otherwise handled religions. Matters. Men and spirits, but but later, men and spirits become intermingled when each household indiscriminately performs for itself <coughs> the religious observances which had hitherto been conducted by the shamans. As a consequence, men lost their reverence for the spirits 
the spirits violated the rules of men, and natural calamities arose. This is often the model of chaos that you see in Chinese writing. Hence, the successor of Shah Hao to handle the affairs of the earth in order to determine uh, what they did was they created different offices for heaven and earth uh, uh, in order to determine the proper places of men. And the emphasis here is, and such is what is meant by cutting the communication between heaven and earth. Right? So who gets to decide uh, whom to worship? Now, Professor Casey Chang, one of the early, very prominent uh, uh, Chinese uh, anthropologists, archaeologists, notes that this myth <clears throat> is the most important reference to shamanism, and it's a central role in ancient Chinese politics in early China. He argues that the king himself was the most important shaman, and his priests sought to monopolize access for the king. Uh, to the sacred uh, uh, access to the sacred authority of heaven. In other words, the emperor, aided by his ritual specialists, not only claimed monopoly of communication with sacred power with regard to other kinds of religions, but also with regard to the people, right? the ordinary people. You have to cut that relationship between heaven and ordinary people. They cannot communicate directly. So this kind of, this modality of historical authority was very different from other kinds of axial civilizations. <coughs> but here is an interesting picture of Teta, which is the temple of heaven, where, uh, in fact, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, very interesting that it was the temple of heaven, which is very cosmologically determined, and is in Beijing. If any of you have been to Teta, the historical sites you will go there, and it's all to all the, uh, not only to heaven, who is not represented, but to the various nature gods and so on who are worshipped there. It's a very elaborate system of ceremony, and I'll talk a little bit about it more. But I just want to tell you one thing, that until the 13th century, or 12th to 13th century, when the Mongol invasions were taking place in China, this uh, ceremony of the emperor to the, the rituals to the to heaven was conducted in the open, in the nature, in Mount Taishan, one of the most sacred mountains in uh, uh, northern China, in Shandong. But uh, the reason given, uh, mainly the main political reason was that the Mongols were coming and they were being threatened, but the reason given by the bureaucrats and the ritual specialists that it be contained in this uh, container, as it were, in this, is that people were watching and learning the performances of rituals, and so that they would then uh, be able to directly access heaven themselves. Right? So you want to cover it up and make it secret, forbidden city idea, sort of looming uh, here. So this is a very important idea. Now, <clears throat> China and transcendence. Now, we, um, you know, I'm sure most of you know about uh, the XNH theory of how you have the notions of transcendence that changes the whole question of religion. The meaning of religion is not just being contractual and sacrificial, but having a transcendent power beyond the here and now. And one of the important things about the, uh, which then formed the basis of all the important global religions from the 6th century onwards, uh, one of the most important sort of elements that comes out of this kind of notion of transcendence is that you get an idea of autonomous moral authority. That is the moral authority to be able to challenge. If you have access, if you have access to this transcendent authority, then you can challenge existing political authority. Right? You can, speaking truth to power kind of idea, right? Where does that truth come from? It comes from an idea of this kind of power. Okay. So, Max Weber <laughs> clearly said that China doesn't have transcendent. India has transcendent authority, the Jews have transcendent authority, uh, the, Christ, the Greeks and then the Christians have, uh, and the Muslims have transcendent authority, but China doesn't. Now, this has been a long fight, and you know, people have then come to different positions on transcendence. Uh, and my point is that it was a limited transcendence, but you have both ideas of transcendence in Chinese culture, as well as uh, counter ideas of transcendence, or the monopoly of transcendence by the emperor. 
So you have both transcendent and imminent dimensions in unique historical configuration and direction. <coughs> heaven was the source, heaven of Tien, uh, all under heaven, son of heaven, you know, those, those ideas will uh, give you a sense of the power of this, was the source of a transhuman moral and cosmic power which could be tapped through moral and supra-ordinary cultivation practices. This is, of course, what the Confucian cultivation is about. It's also Taoist uh, cultivation of nature and the self-relationship to nature. Taoism and Buddhism also provide alternative and different sources of transcendence. Right? Tao speaks about the Tao of which we can speak is not the Tao. That is truly transcendent. It's not something that you can touch and feel or access, right? but you have to approach it. Dharma or Fa in Chinese is also uh, something that has uh, related to the idea of Nirvana or Nirvana. By the late imperial period, what you get is a composite notion of transcendence, which are available in Chinese society. What the imperial state wants to do over time is to control and monopolize this transcendent power. And it's amazing how, you know, the difference between a society like India where religious authority is distributed socially rather than politically. Here the politics wants to control it, right? Uh, and uh, so what it does, the imperial state, and you can get a sense of the power of the state in you know, China and contemporary China, it, it seeks to ban the worship of heaven by anybody other than the emperor and his ritual specialists. Think of the, think of the vast expanse of the empire and how you can do that, right? And it ties very hard. So I'll talk a little bit about how it does it. First, what it does is that all the organized religions, Buddhism and Taoism and so on, it licenses, right? Much like their license today. And it licenses them. They can, so they never really become deeply popular in the institutional sense. Those ideas become deeply popular. But institutionally, the clergy and so on just perform activities for communities. Oh, by the way, you know, there's never been any effort to represent uh, heaven or ten until, of course, the modern period when <laughs> you have all these people questioning ten about this and that and these representations, uh, whatever they are. Uh, okay, back up again. Can you turn back the light on? Light, light, light on. Okay, so um, although only the emperor could worship heaven, there was a whole panoply of gods, spirits, <coughs> and ancestors who could be worshipped by the rest of the population. Right? You, you don't want to deprive them of uh, contractual <coughs> you want a son, you get a son, you can't pass these and you bring somebody and do all that. Just don't go to heaven. That is the imperial privilege. Uh, they, and to satisfy their desire for human. What, so what you get in China, to sort of approach it uh, conceptually, is that you get a vertical division, right? You get a vertical division between what the imperial state can do and what the ordinary people can do. And this is very different from the confessional state which integrates vertically, right? Which integrates community, ch uh, church, community, and state. So this is a vertical division. So, um, now, it is, you know, this was a result of a long historical fight. The Confucians, Confucius and Mencius himself in the 6th, 4th, 3rd centuries and so on, uh, wanted very much to reserve the true transcendent power of heaven among the sage ruler with the Junza. The Junza is the moral prince and not, and both the emperor and the people were subject to this Junza, to the truly sage king, to the Shaman or Junza. So this was the idea. But over time and through a variety of means, the imperial state, certainly by the late imperial period, from about 1600 onwards, was able to uh, subordinate this alternative. Uh, and which is, you know, so the way, the way they were is very interesting. Part of it, of course, is that the Confucians were, they, the Chinese state created the bureaucracy and absorbed the Confucian elite through the bureaucracy. 
Now, within the bureaucracy, you could also demonstrate if you oppose the policy of the emperor. And you could make a strong moral statement in Confucian terms, in very sage terms, but you were sent, if you were lucky, a silken rope to hang yourself. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and people did it. You know, this is, this is a different age. People did it. Um, I don't think anybody could do it now. <laughs> I'm sure. But uh, people are doing it now still. So, um, where was I? Okay, so and throughout Chinese history, you had Neo Confucian movements and you had Buddhistic movements and so on that have sought to challenge the emperor's right to uh, have this monopoly of access to transcendent truth, to absolute value, right, to moral power. <clears throat> but as I said, it was this, the autonomy of uh, Confucianism and other faiths that had a notion of transcendence was very much controlled through a variety of factors. I'm not sure I have time to go into all these factors, but one of the things was lineage ideology or clan ideology based on the idea of ancestor worship, which was also a very important early idea in China. In fact, the emperor's source, he was not only the son of heaven, by the way, he was not God. He was a shaman, right? Remember, he was the son of heaven. Was not heaven itself, which is very different as I've come to the Japanese emperor. And so that's why he was afraid that his mandate could be stolen by somebody else if they performed the right ritual and did all these kinds of things. Yeah. But they were also based upon this other idea of ancestor. And what they did was the emperors claimed to be descendants of the original ancestral god Deep. And they were on the Yellow Emperor in that line of succession. And in fact, he even put Confucian, Confucius to be within his incorporated in the ancestral line of emperors, right? So there was by the Han Dynasty an, an effort, multiple efforts to incorporate Confucianism and these kinds of sources of alternative authority within this lineage ideology. <laughs> and it was very interesting, the Confucians were actually challenged by the Buddhists. So, <clears throat> The Confucians would attack the Buddhists for not accepting the importance of family and uh, what is it called? Uh, when you, <coughs> is this filial uh, filial piety, yes. When you, uh, yeah, uh, would attack the Buddhists for not being filial. So the Buddhists, so they couldn't really go against lineage ideology. Right? So they were pushed into a situation where they had to support, and that got them much more together with the imperial ideology, especially when the Buddhists were challenging them. So they couldn't afford to really do it. But one other very important matter, and we still see this all over East Asia, is the, of course, the fundamental role of the imperial state. What you had with the Tiantan, the Temple of Heaven and everything, is the state orchestration of ritual. It wasn't just an orchestration, it was a synchronization. So when the emperor worshipped in the temple of heaven, all the bureaucrats were worshipping in various state gods, <coughs> to the city god, to other gods, to the village gods, and so on. And it was organized in the hierarchy. And it was simultaneous, so it was synchronization. Right? And this really give you, gives you the sense of the performative power, the performance of power in this uh, thing, all over the empire. You're supposed to do it, and you're supposed to conduct your harvest at a certain time and so on, for which the emperor would initiate the rituals, right? So it was really this ideological power of the Chinese state was something that is unseen, unknown in the kind uh, in the world, the historical world that we see, especially in that scale. So they sought to synchronize state rituals at all levels of the polity and performance of power. Later I'll show how the Japanese used this for modern state. The Confucian literati were also co-opted, as I've said, by the imperial examination system and the bureaucracy, this is well known, and because they then become part of the interests of the state, which uh, they often try to separate the interests of the emperor from the state, but it becomes very hard. It's also very, something very interesting, because China had its economic revolution in Song Dynasty in the 13th century. The Japanese said that this was, you know, what China now needs is socialism, because 
it had its gap. But it never made that transition precisely because it always brought to the elites into the literati, through the bureaucracy and through other affiliations with the bureaucracy. Right? So it was able to stall that transition, right? unlike in Western Europe. Okay, here's some contemporary efforts to look at uh, uh, the revival of China's ancient founding ancestor and so on, which is part of Chinese nationalism now. Early 20th century, they also did a lot of that. Okay. So, let's talk about vertical integration, vertical division, but also vertical mediation. The nature of community formation, I've already said, in Europe is of course very important. What you have, um, of course, after the, you know, from about 800 and so on, you have initially uh, sovereignty was located in the in the church in the in the in the folk and then you get the holy roman empire and there's a huge uh, chaos of the notions of uh, sovereignty and it's not at all clarified you have uh, these different competing states and they also become involved in what we call uh, fiscal militarism right? fiscal militarism is the process where they are in competition with each other, and uh, but it has to do with taking loans in order to gain, gain more resources, and then indebtedness, which leads to more uh, quest for resources and so on. And that's how these uh, states have been seen to develop in Europe from the 13th till the 18th century. But simultaneously, what I also want to say is that there's this ideological composition that creates the idea of the confessional state, which fits very much with these fiscal uh, competitive states, right? And so, and you get this proto-national form with the competition for resources and so on that goes on here. So, so what happens, and ultimately you get this transformation of sovereignty from the church, from the Pope, to the nation state, but not till the 18th century. It is really not to the French Revolution. It's really a 500-year period when they don't can't really decide what is sovereign, and sovereignty is a very important dimension in European history, right? And so, what you get is uh, by the 18th century, you get these vertically integrated communities, which I said, where state, church, uh, and believers are under one god, and you have these proto-national communities, competitive communities. And here, Weber's argument about the Protestant ethic is very important. Because Protestantism is also a very important disciplinary form to create competitive nationalisms, right? People are descended into these kind of things. Not just in terms of their behavior, but in terms of accounting, all these kinds of things become much more precision oriented, right? And success related. So, So over the next few several centuries, these competitive states then become secularized, and the secularization is achieved by the 20th century. Now, for uh, I've sort of uh, already uh, jumped ahead on this, but secularization is where once the the reach, uh, once the the king gets a majority of, uh, and there was a lot of exchange through the middle centuries in Europe of you know bringing. Uh, uh, Huguenot uh, shipbuilders or this that to the right states right to fit them in, and there was a lot of economic exchange going on of getting uh, Catholics uh, to move to states where there are more uh, professional uh, sort of Catholics are needed in those states kind of thing. But what happens is that after a certain point, it becomes important for the state to then protect these minorities that they have in their, in their confessional communities, and that's how really they. The idea of uh, secularism emerges in the European context. It is ultimately because they're confident of their majority. They have to secure this. Uh, they agree in the Westphalian context to, uh, to secure the rights of the minority, to give freedom of religion. So, but in China, as we've seen, they were vertically divided rather than vertically integrated with imperial orthodoxy versus popular religion. But this division was also mediated. It wasn't just that they were divided. It was often mediated, and uh, it's probably not that relevant for this, but it has some very interesting features, because what you have is a whole realm of popular religion, which keeps, um, you know, which is not allowed to uh, worship heaven, 
but which is allowed all different gods and these gods become so popular the Chinese state gets scared and so what it does it, it's as, as one of these authors wrote he says popular religion keeps the state junk keeps the state hoppy because when a god gets too popular then you have to co opt that god into your state and right? and, um, and then but then they produce another god right? who becomes equally popular and so on. So this is this thing that goes on all of the time and uh, so it was popular religion was a vibrant and mediating field of communication and negotiation accommodation and adaptation camouflage and resistance bringing state local elites and popular society into overlapping what I've called cultural nexus and the first uh, piece of work that I published uh, on China is something called Guanti, uh, the uh, superscription of the God of Guanti, God of War Guanti, was originally a uh, Dwara Pala, my Dwara, <laughs> the door uh, God for the Buddhists, although he was originally a, a, a historic figure, he was made into a legend, then different communities started appropriating him, became so popular, and you know, he'd actually murdered uh, district magistrates and probably even his parents or something. But later on, he becomes the icon of Confucian uh, honor. And he, has, he did not read, but he has. You have him. He's a very important figure in Chinese popular culture. You have him reading Confucian texts on the one hand, but a sword on the other hand. The so that kind of thing happens. But they keep keep them hopping and so on. And. Another very important dimension of this popular culture is what we call three-in-one societies. Uh, that is Sajja Hoi, that is to say this is a kind of a group that, that brings in Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism all under one tent, under one umbrella. And in the modern period when they succeed, they even bring in Islam and Christianity into this. So this is a popular religion that both mediates, has elites, but it also has uh, poor people, they are often like Godman religions in India. I don't know how accommodating Godman religions are, but these, these guys, they expand not by converting, but by absorbing, right? So they really, you can think of them as the condominium of religion. And by the 20th century, I made the argument that they probably control over hundreds of millions, or at least at a least hundred million or more. Uh, much more than any Mayfall movement or any, any party at any point in time. And they were, you know, they were just like middle class religious societies in other parts of Asia that you see. And, but they were also very socially active, very uh, integrative and so on. But I won't go on more with them. But they were also, there, and here is an example of a red swastika. So you see how the red swastika is also very important. So they also become like red crescent society and so on. They follow these models. And you can see that this is a contemporary, probably in Singapore, a version of the redemptive societies, yes. Uh, and you see here in Southeast Asia, a redemptive society. This, in fact, is called the Tridharma, because in Indonesia they had to convert the, the Sanya idea into, and they call themselves the Tridharma, right? And uh, uh, they, they, you can see that they're very accommodating. They also have uh, very high organization <coughs> capacities. Do a lot of work. They, for some cities in China were dependent for the infrastructure in the early 20th century on these societies. Now, despite their elite and even orthodox connections, redemptive societies were attacked by the state because they always had a notion of transcendence that was different from that of heaven. They, all, they were attacked always and by the KMT and by the Chinese Communist parties who had their own notion. The KMT were handled them okay for a while, but they also were very suspicious of them, and especially of these messianic ones. You know, after having worked on these redemptive, I was the first one to work on them for a, a decade or so. In 1999, I opened the New York Times and I see there is Falun Gong has been arrested all over China, front page news. I said, finally the other shoe has dropped. This is a redemptive society like no other that suddenly emerged in 1990s and had a huge following and uh, of course it's this, they had such a huge following they scared the Chinese Communist Party because they had members of the military and everybody in them and the party. So, so that was that, that was that brief, brief lorry. So, but I want to say here, uh, the idea is that 
What has happened to this Chinese history is that state orthodoxy and popular religion are locked in a kind of a historical logic, right? Uh, historical cultural logic. The former, that is the state, believes that this kind of popular religion represents a cover for politics. They always say, oh, Falun Gong, you know, that means you're political, you're going to, you're challenging our political authority and so on. But religious believers seek personal and moral empowerment <clears throat> through their transcendent authority, right? And, uh, but this empowerment by itself is not political necessarily. By banning them to begin with, the state extends the logic that politicizes them, right? Automatically. Now, if you look at cases from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so on, where they had also been bad, but then were, you know, once they had their democratic government, they let these guys around, they let them coexist, and they haven't been a political challenge at all, right? As far as you can see, I mean, they do other kinds of things. But uh, they, and in fact, they're very useful for uh, special Buddhist societies in Taiwan. So, this, uh, after 1987, now, <coughs> Just to get back to the whole telescoping of secular and uh, confessionalization. So this is, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party also seeks a mode of confessionalization. But it does it through communist ritual, right? What we call ritual or exegetical bonding through small group uh, events where people are involved to, co to, to convert themselves. Function is to turn yourself over to become a new person and through all kinds of readings of Mao and through getting some land, through uh, uh, pointing at class enemies and so on, you have these rituals of rebirth, right? This happened through the, from the revolution, through the Mao's period. So this was a kind of confessionalization that was also going on. Now, so how do we look at secularism in China? In Europe, as I've said, secularism developed to contain religious warfare between Protestants and Catholics. Uh, but secularism also became an important instrument for state building, right? For state building. Because, of course, you can become under the state's regulatory authority right? in a way that they had not before. And the state, and the Japanese state certainly does this also as much, uses these organizations to. Uh, provide whatever goods that the state may want, education, welfare, this, that, and the other, but regulates them. Now, now despite the legacy of faith-based communities in China, the Chinese Republican state quickly adopts the idea of Western secularism. Say, so, okay, we also need secularism. And what does this do? This brings, and in fact, it was really weird, because you have, you can, you can then decide what is a religion once you have a secularism, right? And so, established institutions, which they already control, become religions. And popular religion is described as superstition, right? So it's not a religion, it need not be accepted. And redemptive societies are also believed <coughs> as superstition, and so on, right? So they are attacked and kept out. Okay, and the thing is that these Buddhist and Taoist societies had organization, but they had very good <coughs> social foundations because there were never community and religions as such. So this became a major problem with the for popular religion. Now, I'll just have one uh, from Japan. I know I'm serious my time very much. Now, Bella, uh, Robert Bella, <coughs> the famous uh, XLH theorist and a Japan specialist, talks about Japan as non-transcendent. He says that the Japanese uh, knew what transcendent power was, but they used the axial to overcome the axial. They used transcendence to overcome transcendence by the idea of divine emperorship. Because they knew about Buddhism, they knew about Confucian ideas of heaven and so on. But they said, our divine emperor is divine and that will overcome everything. <coughs> divine emperorship. In practice, of course, just as in China, you do have redemptive societies, you do have syncretic forms and Buddhist forms of transcendence. But what the Meiji state in the modern period, that is from 1816 to 1912, did, was it adapted the Chinese, the orchestration of rituals and the orchestration of religion to synchronize state ritual under the enhanced ideal of the divine emperor, right? So state Shinto then becomes developed. State Shinto becomes 
and state Shinto, however, is declared by the Japanese to be state ritual and ceremonial and not religious. Even though they're using, they have created these Shinto structures in a hierarchical way all the way down and the Shinto uh, states will also do, um, you know, taxation, recruitment for the army, uh, certifications, statistical work and so on. But they are, and so they, they, they are performing state function, they're using the religiosity of Shinto for it, but they say it's ceremonial and not religious. What we have is religious Shinto, right? So in a way they're confessionalizing, it's what I call confession, not confessionalization of religion, but con confessional nationalism, right? <coughs> so they're bringing in elements of religiosity into, of ritual authority into this. So it's a telescoping of, sec and at the same time they're saying that state Shinto is secular, because basically they're being forced by the European uh, imperialists to say that this is all, you know, you must allow Christian missionaries and so on, so you have to be a secular state. So they said, yeah, it's secular, and state Shinto is secular. Uh, so they telescope secularism and confessionalization <coughs> as well as well. And they attack all the alternative universalisms, the transcendence of Japanese uh, redemptive societies and so on, silenced by state Shinto as superstitious and not religious. Uh, you can see the remainders of this idea of poison in uh, the Yasukuni Shrine, which for those of you familiar with East Asian history, it keeps going there and keeps sort of, uh, once you keep going there, that means, you know, your war crimes, there remain war crimes in the eyes of the others. And it, of course, is tied very much to state Shinto. So what are the historical lessons? I have three more slides. The reconstruction of the European narrative from the world shows not only circulatory manipulation, but also traffic between the religious practices and institutions, traveling between religious and secular forms. So sometimes what you have also is a re-confessionalization. <coughs> After secularism is established, you get a reset, uh, re confessionalization For instance, you know, Rehmat <coughs> Selig uh, talks a lot about uh, you know, the idea of you cannot suppress the religious. It comes back in the French Revolution and so on as well, in a different guise, in a different mode. And then you have none other than Karl Schmitt, the philosopher ultimately of the Nazis, who says that the self-other um, of national, the friend enemy, what he calls the friend enemy that the nation has to always be based upon, that binary, is really none other than our religious ideas. It is none other than the confessional faith and the damned, the believer and the damned. Uh, and so you have this sort of, and of course here, uh, the other are the Jews, right, in Nazi Germany. So what you get is a transformation from confessional to national forms, or you get the uh, religion is detranscendentalized and rhetorically made compatible with secularism of the majority. This is what I call confessional nationalism. China also had some of this, but much more. East Asia is the modern state that adapts state ritualism and leads to a state-led confessionalism. For example, the Maoist ritual state or Shinto, which affects popular religions. You know, in a way, it's different from, say, other parts of the world, which affects minorities. This affects popular religions, also affects minorities, whether you're Tibetan or Muslim in Xinjiang or whatever. It affects them, but it also affects popular religion. Popular religion, including sectarian redemptive societies. Uh, are attacked much more, and that earlier vertical division which you had had in the imperial Chinese state becomes sharpened because there's a very little mediatory, mediation that was going on in the imperial period. Okay, so now we come to the controversial Indian parts. What are the modern historians? Just two slides, I think. India is, we know, historically pluralist with varieties of transcendent authority mixing with forms of devotional and contractual religion. The impact of confessional secular telescoping witnessed, I think, four important uh, responses. The first is secular nationalism committed to freedom of religion, which is, for example, Nehru and I think Gandhi also. Uh, the second is reform Hindu spirituality, Vivekananda, uh, Gandhi again. And I, in my book, I use the case of Agnivesh 
and uh, we, I can't remember it anymore, but he disagreed completely with my interpretation of it, by the way. But anyway, Agnivesh, I thought, was a very interesting example of Arya Samadhi, who was also a Marxist, and how he deals with that. <coughs> and you have the confessionalization of Hinduism with Arya Samad, Hindu Mahasabha, an attempted confessionalization of Hinduism and Islam, Savarika, Hindutva, Jamaat Islami, Muslim League, post-1930, at any rate. And then you have the other uh, expression, which is the politics of identitarian representation by that the British established by religion and caste and language. For electoral mobilization, I think it can it can go in various directions, but it feeds also the confessionalization uh, of religion. Now, historically, the Indian Constitution, in my view, and I'm not very expert on this, has limited or dif differentiated transcendent power from capturing political power. I think it has done that okay. Uh, for instance, even Gandhi was believed in his truth more than in history, but it doesn't find much expression, as far as I can make out, that concept in the Constitution. Most religious activist reformers, especially the Hindu spiritualists, have learned to reconcile their truth with the notion of modern linear time, historical time, and political citizenship by invoking spirituality as a personal social faith. And it represents the classic separation of religious truth versus the state realm. Right? At the same time, many practices and ideas of religious life are being confessionalized into a form of homogenized nationalism, like Shinto. You have this telescoping process of good secularization. Hindutva actually claims to be secular, indeed to be most secular, not privileging any religion. What it wants is Hindutva, which is a moral way of life, not a religion. It uses the moral dimension of secular doctrine to dominate by cultural majoritarianism. So this is unlike East Asia, where a state-led national confessionalization suppresses popular religiosity and its national identities. In India, it becomes more of a majoritarian domination of minorities. Last slide. Secularism is difficult to keep from being captured. It does not automatically permit religious plurality. It is captured either by confessionalization, nationalization mode by the majority or manipulated by the state and most likely when the conjoined action of both. It would appear that in India and much of the world, the freedom of religions protected simply by the rule of law, is becoming increasingly unacceptable. And in the West, it is articulated by intellectuals as post-secularism. All these philosophical thalmas and so on talk about post-secularism. And I think this was also a reason why Ambedkar and others felt that the state and judiciary needed a more moral foundation, the idea of thamma. Ambedkar was fiercely secular, but he opts to become Buddhist and urges that Dhamma be an instrument of government because it is righteousness. And so it is social morality and not a religion. I was very puzzled when Mayavati was elected chief minister, when was it, 2007 or 2007? And she declared that, they asked her, are you going to uh, convert to Buddhism or something? She said, no, I'll only do that when I become prime minister. And I didn't understand what she meant, but I think what she means is, to the extent that we need to attribute much meaning, is that it is that once we have the state, we need to have the state under certain types of moral foundations. But, but my ultimate thing is, so I agree that we do need something beyond uh, just the rights, uh, rule of law. But if constitutionalism by itself cannot secure a sufficient moral foundation, Constitutionalism will still be necessary to secure a secular pluralism where the rights against religious discrimination are as foundational as the right to religious freedom. Now, take another moment of time. Thank you.